My name is Cynthia Rudin, and I'm going to talk about interpretable neural networks for computer vision. And uh, I want to talk about decisions that are computer aided and not automated, because we should be avoiding automated decisions as much as we possibly can for high stakes decisions. Uh, but that's hard because it means the humans and computers have to work together and understand each other. But computers don't always behave the way we want them to, and it's not always easy to figure out what they're doing. Now I'm talking about medical decisions here, and the one thing that everyone knows when they start to work with medical data is that it is really, really messy. And it's really easy for a machine learning model to get confused. And I want to introduce you here to Clever Hans. Hans is a horse. Uh, Hans uh, really seemed to be quite clever. Um, he could answer questions like, if the eighth day of the month comes on a Tuesday, what is the date of the following Friday? And uh, Hans would answer his, the questions by tapping his hoof 11 times. And his owner had no idea how he was doing this, and no one else had any idea how he was doing this. But it turned out that Hans was simply looking at the level of stress in the owner's face. And then when the owner would relax his face, Hans would simply stop tapping his hoof. And this is the kind of problem we don't want in medical imaging. We want an AI system to reason about an image in a way that we could actually trust. So why is interpretability important in all this? Well, interpretability helps you detect uh, confounding, like in the Clever Hans phenomenon. Um, interpretability helps with high stakes decisions, like where, where a human really needs to know the reasoning process. Uh, and interpretability helps you troubleshoot, right? You can't, um, you, know, you can't second guess the reasoning process of a black box because you don't know what it is. And then, you know, will, will it work if I switch equipment? And if it's a black box, I don't know. Um, will it work for all types of patients? Can I check if it's working on my current patient? Um, is the information that I fed into the system correct? And, you know, it sort of, when you use a black box, it takes away the, the responsibility that, that, that is, it, it, it actually leaves a puzzle as to who is responsible because you know, it is the doctor's responsibility to make a good decision, but the doctor actually can't do that if, they, um, if, if they're just using this black box to make the decision. So now it's the black box making the decision. And what we want here is for the computer to do what it does best, like crunch data to find patterns, and we want to preserve the human's, the human's sort of systems level way of thinking about problems. So as you can see, um, the use of black box models makes all of these problems worse. And so in particular, black box models turn computer aided decisions into automated decisions. Now, a lot of people try to explain neural networks, but it doesn't really work very well because neural networks, you know, standard neural networks are not designed to be interpretable. So there's no reason why they naturally should be. And uh, a lot of people particularly like saliency, uh, like saliency maps or attention maps, um, which is supposed to, you know, this, this example here, it's supposed to give you the, um, the, uh, the explanation for why this uh, image is classified as a Siberian Husky. And uh, indeed, the network highlights the part of the Husky that you'd expect for classifying a Husky. So you think you believe the network, right? You, you might even trust it, sort of. But then you look at what else the network is doing. And it turns out that it gives you almost exactly the same explanation for why that image contains a musical instrument, right? A transverse flute. So um, yeah, it's, this is not, not what we want, right? Um, and the, the, the issue that I'm concerned about is that there's a lot of work in radiology on attention maps right now, but they, they really cause a problem because they just tell you where the network is looking and they don't tell you what the network is actually doing with the pixels that it highlights, right? So this is like if you wanted to sell a house um, and you ask the real estate agent, well, how did you price my house that way? And the real estate agent said, well, I was looking at your roof. And you said, well, what about my roof? What did you use about my, my roof? And, and the real estate agent says, no, I'm, I'm looking at your roof. <laughs> There's no explanation. It's just where you're looking. And um, yeah, I'm concerned about the, the use of uh, saliency maps as sort of sufficient explanation in um, radiology right now. Now, uh, I, I want to just talk briefly about uh, the problem spectrum for, for, you know, where do you need an interpretable neural network? And I claim that you don't really need it for tabular data. For tabular data, 
a lot of the machine learning methods perform the same. Uh, whereas for raw data, like images or, or, or sound waves or uh, you know, large amounts of text, then you know, the neural networks are, are tending to, to sort of perform better than, than the rest. Um, whereas with tabular data, with minor preprocessing, all the methods tend to have similar performance. And so you can even get very sparse models, like very sparse decision trees or, or very sparse linear models. And so I'm going to stick to um, you know, raw data for, for talking about interpretable neural networks. OK, so um, as I said, for, for tabular data, you can get interpretable models pretty easily because you just use you can use sparse models or, or other types of sort of more traditional um, interpretability techniques. Whereas with raw data, we have to think carefully about you know what what is the definition of interpretability that, that we actually want to use. Um, and um, but in neither case in neither case do you actually need a black box. You can actually get interpretable like inherently interpretable models in both cases where um, an interpretable model is this is not a, a post hoc explanation of a black box. This is a model that's actually constrained so that it reasons about things in a, a specific way to be, so it's actually interpretable. OK, so um, yeah, so I, I, I wrote all this in this paper, you know, stop explaining um, machine learning, black box machine learning models for high stakes decisions and use interpretable models instead. And so what, I, what I'm advocating for sort of tabular data are, are you know, all the many different other kinds of models. And for, raw, for this very raw kind of data, like images, um, uh, interpretable neural networks. OK, so let me talk about what, um, what, what I think uh, an interpretable network might be. Uh, and obviously, there's more than what uh, more definitions than, than I'm going to give here. I'm just going to give two definitions. Uh, I'll start with one that uses case-based reasoning. And in, in particular, uh, case-based reasoning is like, the way real estate agents price houses. It's like, well, why did you price my house that way? Well, it's because your roof looks like that other guy's roof and your backyard looks like that other guy's backyard and the combination of their prices is, going, is, is, is contributing to the price that I'm giving to your house. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, what this network does. Um, so this, this is a network called ProtoPNet. I'm gonna give you an example of, of Proto Pnet operating on a on a bird data set and trying to give you an explanation for why a bird is classified a certain way. This is a clay colored sparrow. Uh, I don't know a thing about birds, so um, it's nice to have the network explain to me why it thinks this bird is a clay colored sparrow. And the network will point out different parts of the bird, and it'll say, "Well, I think this part of the bird looks like this part of that bird, and this bird, I you know this bird." Um, this bird on the right, I, I know what that is. That's a prototypical clay-colored sparrow. I, I have that in, in, you know, as a comparison point um, as a prototypical clay-colored sparrow. And then I'm going to look at you know, the, the belly and the wings of the, of the bird, and those look like um, you know, these other prototypical clay-colored sparrows. And, and the feet, they look like this, the, the uh, feet of this, other, this prototypical clay-colored sparrow. And so, um, so this is how the network actually reasons. Um, this is not a post hoc explanation. The network is actually using the comparisons to other, you know, to these prototypes um, to, to actually reason about this image over here. And the prototypes are learned uh, and the ways to compare images that's also learned. Okay, none of this is, is human. It's, it's the same thing as a standard machine learning algorithm. It's data fed into a machine learning model. Model learns how to reason this way, that's it. Okay. So um, because the method says, well, this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that, uh, we decided to call the paper, this looks like that. And uh, the way the technique works is that you take your favorite black box and you add a prototype layer to that black box that forces the network to do this kind of case-based reasoning. And the prototypes are learned during training. So in other words, if you take your standard black box convolutional neural network, and then you add an extra layer in it, sort of right before the last fully connected layer, um, then it, that, that prototype layer forces it to reason um, using, the, using the prototypes. So this is not, like when you think of prototype methods, you often think of k-nearest neighbors. This is not exactly k-nearest neighbors. It's sort of like k-nearest parts of prototypical cases or something like that. Uh, okay. 
So um, we, usually, we usually designate 20 prototypes per class. Um, the number of prototypes can be chosen as a parameter of the network. And the network scans the image looking for parts of it that look like each of the prototypes for each class. So I want to show you how um, the, this, the major part of this computation um, actually works, the, the part at the end, starting from the prototype layer and, and going to the end. Okay. So uh, here's an example where um, this bird up on the top there is classified as a red-bellied woodpecker. And so why is that? And the network thinks that um, the bird's red head, bright red head, um, looks like a prototype that has a bright red head. And it's looking at the head and saying, well, I think this is really similar. And it's providing a number of points for that, which happens to be 6.499. And then it, it actually um, has a score for each prototype that tells it how important that prototype is to the red-bellied woodpecker class. And so the first prototype gets a score of 1.18. Uh, and then the combination of the, the similarity score, so, so how similar the image is, the, the, so how similar the head is to the prototype head, um, and how important that prototype is to that class, those numbers get multiplied together to give you that 7.6 six, nine uh, there. Okay, so it does this for, for all 20 prototypes for the red-bellied woodpecker class and adds up the total and it gets to 32 points. Um, and it also does the same calculation for all of the other classes as well. So here I'm showing on the right um, an example of the, um, the red-bellied, um, the, sorry, the red cockaded woodpecker class. And for that, um, for that class, uh, apparently red cockaded woodpeckers don't have red heads and so it wasn't able to get as many points um, in comparing the similarity between the birds. It definitely looked at a similar pattern in the feathers of the birds and got a bunch of points that way, but it only got 16 points in total and so it just couldn't get up to the, uh, the 32 from the red cockaded woodpecker class and so that's why it, why it decided that it was a red cockaded woodpecker. Now, sometimes the model gets it wrong and you can kind of see where it goes wrong, which is, which is kind of fun. Uh, so here's a case where, where it screwed up. Um, now, as I told you, the network can use any base model. It starts with a black box and then you add an extra prototype layer to it. Here, the black box was a dense net 161. And you can see that um, this, this bird here um, was classified as a prothonotary warbler instead of a Wilson's warbler. And it's actually a Wilson's warbler. Um, now, the, the thing is, when you look at these comparisons, one thing that's really quite striking is that the bird actually really looks like a prothonotary warbler. Those comparisons look really good. Um, and it's looking at sort of the eyes and the beak and the coloring. Um, it, it, it's really quite, uh, quite striking how, why this bird was classified that way. It's because it actually looks like that class. Um, but then if you, if you switch the dense net 161 over to a VGG16, it actually gets it right. And um, as you can see, um, what the network is doing here is it's, it's again looking at the eyes and the beak, but there's an issue with this bird, which is that it doesn't quite look like a standard Wilson's warbler. It's missing a very distinguishing characteristic, which is the black on the top of the head. And so what I think might be going on is that this bird might be a baby Wilson's warbler, which happens to look like a prothonotary warbler when, because it doesn't have that black patch on the top of its head yet. Now, we've been enjoying playing with the Cub 200 data set, which is a you know, benchmark data set in computer vision. Uh, there's you know, 200 classes of birds in this data set, and um, the original black box accuracy is, is between 74.6% and 82.3%. We tried tried a whole lot of different black box models just to see kind of what, how accurate they really were on this data set. And then um, when we took all of these models and added the, the, um, uh, the prototype layer and made them, a pro made them, made them proto peanuts, um, the accuracy was right in the same range. Um, and we could also stack the proto peanuts together from the different black boxes and we um, were able to get an accuracy that was actually better than any of the original black boxes. And, and we actually uh, got an accuracy that was 
better than any of the black boxes, which, um, which was, you know, 84%, 84.8%. Um, and yet it's still, you know, doing case-based reasoning, it's still um, an, an interpretable model. Um, so, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, even for computer vision, even where the, the deepest of the deep neural networks are, are born, we can still have an interpretable model of the same accuracy as a black box. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not the only group that's shown that. There's many groups, obviously, working on different aspects of, of interpretable neural networks. And I've seen before of papers that have, have also claimed that they were able to add interpretability constraints without uh, changing uh, the accuracy. Okay, so we were, when we designed this, we were thinking, well, okay, now we've proven that we could do it. Um, where, where do you think we might actually want to use this? And we decided that we would try um, working on uh, mammography. Now, um, mammography is a, a, a screening, um, it's, it's a field where you screen for breast cancer, which is a leading cause of death in, in the US. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of cases diagnosed each year in the US, uh, causing tens of thousands of deaths. It's also the hardest task in all of radiology. Uh, for instance, radiologists miss about a fifth of breast cancers Half of women getting an annual mammogram over 10 years are going to have a false positive. And um, also, uh, up to three quarters of biopsies come back as benign. So in other words, these are potentially unnecessary surgeries. And so we thought, you know, if we, uh, um, if we thought like, you know, uh, this, that, that if we can't do much easier computer vision tasks, right, this one is not going to work. But we couldn't do this alone, so we made some friends. Um, so this is, this is uh, my students, and uh, we made some friends here in the radiology department uh, at Duke, um, and in particular, Joseph Lowe and his team. And Joseph uh, actually pointed out to me that there are several AI algorithms that have FDA approval for radiology, which made me um, quite nervous because, you know, a lot of them are, you know, they're not, they're, they're not really interpretable. Maybe saliency is kind of as far as they go. Um, but I, I want to point out that not all uh, radiology problems require interpretability. In fact, there's a large number of them that don't benefit from interpretability. So for instance, if you're just trying to detect whether an image contains a breast lesion at all, um, it's, it's fine to have a black box that says there is no lesion in this image. Because you know, what's the explanation for that? Like, I didn't find one. There's just nothing here in the image, right? So for that, a black box is fine. but um, if you're talking about the, the harder decision that a radiologist would make, which is, should I order a biopsy for that lesion? You know, you, that's the case where it's not a good idea to trust the, the black box because, you know, um, you know, we don't want that kind of decision to be automated because computers are not, you know, they're not as good as humans for, the, for this task at this point. And humans have a hard time even with this task. Okay. So, um, yeah, why is this task hard? Well, uh, as you know, um, AI radiology is just hard. Uh, and, you know, there's, um, there have been cases where, uh, like, and there were FDA algorithms that were approved that for radiology, and then they used them in different facilities and found out they didn't work that well. So it's, it's, in some sense, these AI algorithms have, have sort of already failed in some ways, and we don't know why they're not working because they're black boxes. Um, another reason why uh, AI mammography is hard is because mammography is hard. Um, and uh, also, we don't have any data. It's really difficult to do anything when you have no publicly available data, or at least very little publicly available data, which makes working in you know, any kind of medical imaging very difficult if you don't have data. Um, and it's, it's really hard to get it. And then um, we also had this problem that uh, there's a lot of confounding in, in the sense that the algorithm can often be right for the wrong reasons. It's very, very, very hard to deal with computationally. Um, so another issue is that um, doctors are not actually predicting malignant versus benign, which is what the standard machine learning tools are designed to do is just to predict whether the lesion is malignant or benign. But that's not the right problem to solve because all the, all the doctors want to do is figure out whether to order a biopsy. 
And if there's even a 2% chance that it's malignant, they'll order the biopsy. And they actually have to go through a series of, you know, a special reasoning process. You know, by law, they have to go through a special reasoning process to figure out whether to biopsy the lesion. And if it's just a black box, it's not going to help with that reasoning process. So, um, yeah, so an uninterpretable approach would just take the image of the lesion and just give you no information at all other than the prediction, right? That the probability of malignancy is low, predict benign, no reason. Then if we talk about attention only approaches like saliency approaches, they would say, well, the probability of malignancy is low, predict benign because I'm paying attention here, because, because blob. And that's not really informative. It doesn't really tell the doctor how the network's actually thinking about this blob. So, um, so our method does something quite different. Um, so the, the method that we're, that we're working on is called um, interpretable AI algorithm for breast lesions. And what it does is it takes different parts of the lesion and compares them to prototypical lesions that have various margin mass margin types. So for instance, it might say the top of the lesion looks like this lesion that has an indistinct margin and therefore I'm going to give it some points because indistinct margins are more likely to, to be cancerous. Uh, and then, you know, the bottom of the lesion, well, that looks kind of circumscribed. It looks like this other circumscribed lesion. And so I'm going to subtract points from the malignancy score because circumscribed lesions are less likely to be, to be um, malignant. Okay, so that's, that's how, the, how the idea kind of works. And then, um, you know, kind of given a, a region to, to analyze, uh, of in, in the image, um, the network would sort of provide these similar prototypes, calculate a score for each prototype, and then um, it will uh, do its thing for each of the classes, each of the mass margin types, like it'll make a circum ca calculate all the points and the comparisons to the prototypes for a circumscribed class, spic spiculated class, indistinct class, and then get the mass margin scores, and only then Will it, will it try to predict benign versus malignant? And it'll show everything to the doctor. Everything that it's doing, it'll show to the, show to the doctor. And then the doctor can sort of decide whether, whether it's right. Um, we have three, um, three classifiers here. There's you know, one for each class. Um, as I mentioned, circumscribed, speculated, and indistinct. There are prototypes for each class. And um, yeah, the nice thing is that the doctor doesn't need to trust it because the doctor can go back and say, you know, I don't think this looks like that. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of difficulties occur because of lack of data. Uh, and this is gonna cause a problem for any kind of um, application of interpretable neural networks. It's really hard to train these algorithms without a lot of data. Um, the public data availability is abysmal. Um, some of the public data is really low quality, made with outdated equipment and in, in using inconsistent labeling, like the labels are, all, you know, not not consistent from from one you know one to the next um, and then we asked for we, we tried we tried to use a, a very well-known data set on mammography and they actually wanted us to hand over our IP before we even started using the data and we said no thank you we're not going to do that so we got some data from Duke luckily um, Dr. Lowe was able to sort of locate a, a data source at Duke um, and you know, this is really a problem because we had to use inside connections to get data. Um, but we got, you know, over a thousand digital screening mammogram images of, of masses in the breast from 484 patients. And you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, you know, this is such a tiny data set. How are they actually getting anywhere? And what's even worse is that some of the classes were so uh, rare that we actually couldn't use them. Um, so the microlobulated class, we couldn't use it. It was only 41 images. And then we had about half our data set, right, 579 images, had margins that were obscured. And that's actually not clinically useful because obscured margin means you just need to take the picture again. So, so that's not what we, what we wanted there. Um, so we actually couldn't use any of that. So we were really left with a very small data set. And so the question is, well, how were we going to learn from that data set? So we said, okay, let's give it a try. And we took our data and we just poured it into, you know, poured, poured it into our machine learning algorithm and who should show up but uh, Clever Hans. 
Uh, and in particular, we found that the network was using information from healthy tissue and comparing that to the prototypes. This is not good. This is not what we want. It's not even using the lesion, right? Um, well, you know, you could say, well, at least we successfully applied the interpretable machine learning technique without losing accuracy, um, which probably means the black box is confounded as well. But we found a solution that at least allows us to get more information out of our data. And we didn't lose any accuracy, right? The black box accuracy was, was equal to the interpretable accuracy. So that, that wasn't an issue. It was just doing things that we knew were wrong. And so we came up with um, the idea to use fine annotation to, to kind of direct the network toward the parts of the image that it really needs to look at. So we hired a bunch of radiologists to actually label the parts of the image that are actually um, useful here um, for that, that the radiologist would really use to figure out whether the lesion is, um, you know, needs to be biopsied. And then we, um, we generalized the proto-peanut technique that I was talking about um, to handle a combination of you know, regular labels, but also these fine-grained labels. And this actually really helped. We, we actually still matched the black box accuracy, so still no loss in accuracy, but we were able to get the network to reason about things the same way. Okay, so yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's what we did. Um, so now after, after training this, we have these three mass margin classifiers over here. And then we trained a malignancy classifier at the, at the end, um, just so that we could see how we were doing. Um, so I'm going to show you more, more detail on this part of the network here. So in particular, I'm going to show you an example of what comes out of the circumscribed class. Um, okay, so here's an example of why this image was correctly classified as circumscribed. Okay, so there's a lesion, there's the prototypes, it's doing the comparison to the, the prototypes, and then um, you know, it's calculating the scores for each of them and adding them all up, okay? So this is not a black box with an explanation. If it's wrong, you know exactly what the points were for each comparison it made, and you can troubleshoot it in real time. Well, if you're a radiologist, <laughs> maybe, maybe not me. Okay, so here's a, another example from the spiculated class, and you can really see how the spicules kind of appear in, you know, you can see how it's highlighting the spicules and comparing it to other image, images with these spicules. Okay, uh, cool. So as I mentioned, um, we're not really losing any accuracy over the black box methods. Um, the, the performance is as good as better than uh, uninterpretable techniques, but, but the uninterpretable techniques have an advantage, which is to, they get to use confounding information. Okay, um, cool. So how did we solve all these issues? Well, uh, first of all, with the confounding, we used the fine annotation to help with that. Uh, the data issue, well, my collaborator helped solve it. Again, not a permanent uh, generalizable solution. And then we, um, to, to handle this issue of, 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 of designing a system that would, would actually be helpful, we chose not to um, just predict malignant versus benign. We decomposed the problem to try to get the network to reason about the way, um, kind of like the way that a human radiologist would, would reason about the image, which is to look at the mass margins and use case-based reasoning so that the network could explain itself. And what we did not do is to use a black box method plus saliency. We didn't do that. And we also didn't just predict malignant versus benign. We actually sort of went, went to the trouble of breaking it down so that the reasoning process was, was sort of matching what the radiologists actually have to do. Okay, so let me talk about um, a second um, approach for interpretable neural networks, um, which is to do neural disentanglement. And I'll show, I'm going to show you a a specific technique for neural disentanglement called concept whitening. Okay, so this is the, the, the concept whitening technique. It's kind of like principal component analysis for neural networks. It's like PCA, right? And uh, um, here's the, just that's the paper in case you're interested. So anyway, um, as you know, convolutional neural networks are not naturally disentangled. Um, you wouldn't normally have an, a node that controls all the information about airplanes, a node that controls all the information about cars, and about dogs, right? Usually the information about these concepts sort of flows all over the place through the network. Right? You don't have a grandmother node. That's something that we, 
we sort of think of that we might have, but, but the truth is that the grandmother information might be, you know, even if it activates on that one node, it might also activate on lots of other nodes too. These nodes are not, not pure. Okay. Um, and so what people often do to try to disentangle neural networks is they start with a black box and then they try to use what are called concept vectors to try to disentangle it, which are, are post hoc. And they don't really accomplish this. Um, they, they really have a lot of issues. So I want, I want us to consider the latent space of a batch norm layer. Okay, so what I'm showing you are two, two axes here with the activation of neuron one and neuron two on the axis. Okay. And these concept vectors point to sort of locations in the latent space or directions in the latent space where there are lots of airplanes or cars or whatever it is. But the problem with this uh, idea is that um, these vectors which point toward the concepts um, can be close to each other even if the concepts are totally, totally different from each other. Um, so here I have the orange vector and the, um, uh, the green vector pointing in a very similar direction despite the fact that these are different concepts. So um, yeah, the concepts are not naturally orthonormal. So what we decided to do was propose an alternative to the concept, uh, to the um, uh, concept vectors technique, which is concept whitening. So concept whitening tries to whiten the space, kind of like make it like white noise, um, and make these concept vectors orthogonal to each other and force them to align themselves on the axis. Okay. So when a concept whitening module is added to a convolutional neural network, the latent space is whitened, meaning decorrelated and normalized, and the axes of the latent space are aligned with the, with the concepts of interest. So let me show you kind of how that works. Um, and so here we go, I'm, I'm whitening the space, so it looks like white noise there. And then uh, I'm going to sort of rotate these concepts so that they are along the axes, and they're, um, they're orthogonal, and they're you know aligned with the axes. Okay, so that's the idea behind concept whitening. All right, so um, when the concept whitening module is added to different layers, there's some really interesting things that happen. Um, and uh, now remember that, that concept whitening forces all the information of the that the network uses about a concept um, at, at that point in the network. It forces it to go through only one node. Okay, so that the node is actually pure. There is actually a grandmother node, or there is actually an airplane node. Okay, so um, yeah, so if you put a concept whitening module at the second layer, then it's sort of taking all the information that the network is using about airplane at, if, at the second layer and just putting it all into, this, you know, has to go, all that information has to go through one node. So what information about airplane could the network possibly be using two layers in, right? It couldn't possibly represent an actual airplane two layers in. So what it does is it forces all the information it naturally uses about airplane to go through that one node. It's like a primitive version of an airplane. And so let's, let's look at what it thinks is the most extreme version of an airplane. Okay, so this is the most extreme end of the, of these, uh, you know, the airplane axis in the second layer. And what you see are sort of not airplanes, but they are white or gray objects on blue backgrounds. And so this is its primitive notion of an airplane. And then for um, bed, for the concept of bed, it puts kind of bright colors. And then for a person, it seems to put these like stringy textures. And so these are its, its sort of primitive notion, notions of these concepts. So in earlier layers, um, color and texture information related to the concepts are, tend to be represented along the axes. Whereas if you look at kind of the 16th layer, then um, what you'll see is that the, the um, concept information now lies sort of, sort of right along the axis, axes and you're, you're getting um, you know, the, the most extreme ends of the, of the axes actually representing these concepts that you told it to. Um, because it has the power now to, to do that. So the axes are now really pure concept vectors. This is a pure airplane um, 
neuron and, and a pure person neuron and so on. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's take a look at how an image travels through the layers of a network. And I, oh, I chose a particularly interesting image here, which is an orange sunset. So it has neither a bed nor an airplane in it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so let's see what happens. So, well, in earlier layers, the bed axis gets, high, gets, gets activated a lot, right? The bed neuron gets activated a lot because it has orange in it and orange is a bright color and the primitive version of bed is, the primitive version of a bed is, is bright colors. Um, and it doesn't think it's an airplane at this point. But then uh, as, uh, as we travel through the network, um, then things change because it's starting to realize, you know, this maybe is not a bed. And then it's seeing a blue sky and it's saying, you know, maybe this is actually like, maybe it does have some airplane information about, about it. And so it's gonna activate on that airplane axis as well. Um, and so then it's still kind of deciding toward the end, sort of not sure what to do with this crazy image. And then it, um, at the very end, it sort of says, it sort of figures out that there's actually much more information about airplane in this image because of the sky than there is about, um, than there is about bed. Okay, so the advantages of concept whitening over batch norm are that, um, well, first of all, you're not sacrificing any accuracy. They're, they're giving, you know, you can add CW to, to, to a neural network without sacrificing accuracy. Accuracy is on par with standard CNNs. It's actually really easy to use. Um, if you have a pre-trained model, you, you can swap out the um, batch norm layer with CN, CW, uh, and it requires only one additional epoch of further training, so one pass through the data set. Um, it does require some more data to train it because you need to tell it like, these are people, please, you know, please create the person axis from these people. So you, you do have to have different data sets to define um, the, the concepts that go on the axes, but, but that's, that's really it. Um, and it nicely, it nicely disentangles the latent space, which is really, uh, really very convenient. Okay. So um, what I've shown you are two techniques. Um, and, uh, I've started with, um, you know, the prototype network, which does case-based reasoning and fine annotation. This is strictly better than saliency because it doesn't just tell you where the network is looking. It's telling you what it's doing with those pixels. And then I talked about the concept whitening technique. And then, um, what I've shown is that it's, it's something that's strictly better than post hoc concept vectors because it's actually aligning the concepts on the axes and not relying on the concepts to be orthogonal in the first place, which they actually are generally not. Um, and so it's, it's sort of not, a, it's, it's sort of forcing the network to do what we, we actually wanted it to do rather than sort of assuming that it, it's gonna be like that, which it's not. Okay, so the takeaways from my talk are that there's really no scientific evidence supporting a trade-off between interpretability and accuracy in deep learning. Um, interpretability helps troubleshoot, helps accuracy. And um, it's also a matter of time, just a matter of time until companies try to use black box models for biopsy decisions. I'm really worried about that day, um, which is why I'm trying to get these, um, these radiology models out there now for mammography so that, um, that people know that there's an alternative to the black box models for, for biopsy decisions. And so I've just put in, um, I just put the links to all the papers that I discussed up here um, and, and a couple model, a couple other papers as well. And um, in particular, the paper on the bottom is um, a review paper that talks about 10 technical grand challenges, including different versions of interpretable neural networks um, are all discussed in that paper. All right, thank you very much.